I'd like to introduce Dr. Honey Thomas, who is consultant cardiologist working at the Northumbria Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust in the northeast of England. Um, Honey has a subspecialty interest in heart failure and advanced rhythm management uh, and complex device implantation. Um, as part of her role, she's introduced and jointly led the service for implantation and follow up of complex cardiac devices across the trust in the northeast. She's involved in cardiology research. She acts as principal investigator on several multi centre and NIHR trials. She's got a major interest in AF. She's passionate about improving the quality of care. Um, particularly for people um, in that area and has developed local and regional pathways to try and optimise the care of patients with AF, um, which culminated in her designing and introducing an innovative, innovative patient safety alert card, it's far too early for big words, uh, for non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants. Um, and that's successfully been implemented across the north of England um, and adopted by many other parts of the UK. Again, a very, very busy, talented lady that we're very fortunate to have speaking with us this morning. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Pleasure. Slightly embarrassed by the, uh, by the big up bio intro. Um, yes, I'm Honey Thomas. I'm a cardiologist up in the northeast. Um, I've got a lot of interest in AF and stroke prevention. And I'm going to just try and talk a bit about um, some of the opportunities and challenges uh, we've faced with managing uh, atrial fibrillation um, in the setting of COVID-19. It's I'm in an unusual experience sat in my bedroom. I have no idea if anyone's listening either now or later, but I'll assume that there's people listening and carry on talking. So these are my disclosures. So much used term, atrial fibrillation in these unprecedented times. What's, what are the challenges? Well, we've got diagnostic challenges and opportunities, and I'm going to talk a bit about remote screening options, pinning down people's symptoms in the new world. I'm going to talk a bit about stroke prevention, initiation and optimization of anticoagulated patients. And I'm just going to talk a bit about AF and COVID in general, because it's quite interesting and you can't do a talk without talking about COVID a bit at the moment. So the challenges for us when we're managing atrial fibrillation um, is the first thing we have to do is we have to find the patients with AF. It sounds pretty obvious, but actually it's a major step in stroke prevention. So historically, there's been a selection of ways where we might pick up patients who are in AF. There are things that we can do to patients and there's things that patients can do to themselves. So here we've got the obvious things. We've got halter monitors, uh, event recorders, ECGs, loop recorders. There's the pulse check and devices like the Alive Core device, which many are familiar with, which is a little kind of Bluetooth or um, uh, audio linking thing that links to a phone or a tablet and records a single lead or even a six lead ECG these days. Those technologies can often span um, us and them as well. This is an example of a live core device, just to be uh, aware of, and I promise I won't show ECGs throughout this, because I know it's not a cardiology talk, but effectively, this is the kind of heart tracing you'll get from this single lead device recorded as a PDF. You can send it to your GP or your cardiologist, and here you can see a rapid, irregularly irregular heart rate. You can see it's AF, but also the device has algorithms in which will tell you it's AF, so you've spotted that patient and made a diagnosis. For comparison, other things that cause an irregular pulse that you might feel look completely different um, on the tracing. So we can really clinch the diagnosis straight away, even if it's gone away by the time the patient attends for a 12 lead ECG. So in addition to what else we can do, more and more there's things that patients can do. There are lots more patients monitor their blood pressure at home. The home blood pressure monitors will typically have an alert if the pulse is irregular. There are lots of smartphone apps. Typically, they use the camera on the phone, pretty much like a SATS probe, to measure heart rate and then look at the rate and irregularity. Uh, over the summer, last summer, when there really wasn't very much to do other than sit at home, I spent a bit of time playing around with these apps because I'm a bit sad. Um, and there's lots of them. Some of them you have to pay for. I hate paying for apps. And the best one I found is something called Photo AFib Detect. It's free, you use your finger on the smartphone camera. I sent it to my dad, who's not medical, got him to have a play with it. And it very effectively tells him if his pulse is irregular or regular. And actually he's carried on using it because it seems like a good idea. So, um, so there are lots of opportunities out there. There's um, Fitbits, 
there's heart rate monitors that patients wear, which are a poison chalice because people come with all sorts of numbers and things that they want you to talk about. But um, this technology is there and um, we need to remember that it might be useful. Um, the daddy of all of these is the Apple Watch, which is a fantastic bit of kit. And the latest series Apple Watches have a um, algorithm to detect if your pulse is irregular. And they also incorporate the same technology as in that Alive core device. So they can also record a single EDCG from your watch to store it on your phone as a PDF so you can send it to someone. So it will screen you for AF, it will prove it with an ECG, it will have a go at interpreting the algorithm, whether it thinks it's AF, and then it will provide you with the raw data so you can show it to your doctor. It's fantastic. The trouble is most people at risk of atrial fibrillation do not have an Apple Watch um, because uh, it's not quite the right demographic, but this data is available and people can um, take much more ownership of it. This is kind of trace you just get from an Apple Watch, same as with an Alive Core, and it's got a positive predictive fire of 84% um, for uh, people who've got an irregular pulse having AF, so pretty good studies from that. This is increasingly important because in the COVID era, we lost a lot of the ways that we identify people as being an AF. We lost the ability to easily do ECGs, to <clears throat> easily fit halter monitors. We lost the ability to feel people's pulses. You know, even when we see, when we have consultations now, more and more, we're doing it remotely. We're not seeing them. Even when they come for their vaccinations, we're trying to get them in and out quickly. All opportunities for the simple old fashioned pulse check, which was hugely effective. The live core, again, they have to be in front of you to do it and more and more patients aren't. So we have to perhaps be more proactive with the tech now that we're not seeing the patients. Does it matter? Yes, it does. So this data is um, from Denmark. We've got really good registry data. And the top panel is a historic data in 2019 with the bars showing how much AF there is both in and out of hospital and the dotted and solid lines showing um, the uh, proportion of strokes related to first time atrial fibrillation diagnosis, either in or out of hospital. And what you can see is when Denmark hit the lockdown where it goes um, faded on the bottom panel of this year, or oh, well, last year now, uh, you can see that the rates of atrial fibrillation first diagnoses drop. And you can see that alongside that, the rates of ischemic stroke go up. So it's as simple as that. If we don't see the patients, we don't diagnose the AF, we don't anticoagulate them, and the stroke rate goes up. So we know that to be true. And when the next lot of SNAP data comes out for the UK, I'm sure we'll prove the same because it matters. Um, AF is common and it's more common as you get older and about 22% of men over 85 will have atrial fibrillation. So it's a really, really common problem. And there's about one and a half million people in the UK with AF. Stroke prevalence goes up fivefold when AF is there. And about 20 to 30% of ischemic strokes are caused by cardiac emboli. And usually that's due to atrial fibrillation. And AF strokes are nasty strokes. I'm wary about talking about blood clots at all in a, in a conference of thrombosis, but my simplistic cardiologist understanding is a big bit of clot takes out a big bit of brain when you've got AF. There's about 12 and a half thousand strokes in the UK every year due to AF. And around 4,800 patients who come with a stroke will have AF diagnosed for the first time at that point. So they have had a missed opportunity potentially prior to that. And what really matters as well, and this is the latest SNAP audit, which is looking at patients who, prevent, who present with stroke, who we knew had atrial fibrillation before they presented. That's about 19% of stroke patients. And under two thirds of those stroke patients were anticoagulated prior to their stroke. So over 6,000 patients every year, and this data has been pretty stable, disappointingly for a while, with an AF-related stroke were not anticoagulated prior to arrival. And they had, were a missed opportunity to prevent that stroke from happening. This is just some observational data from England, um, which shows that um, as the guidance and the science has progressed over recent years, that Anticoagulant use has gone up, antiplatelet use has gone down in line with the evidence and the guidance, and along with that stroke incidence has also fallen. So it does make a difference. If we put people on the right treatment, we can stop them having strokes, and that's a hugely, hugely important goal. So in terms of an overview of how to manage anticoagulation in AF, this is the latest version of the ESC guidance, which is pretty contemporary from last year. And there's a couple of key things in the modern way of managing anticoagulation in AF. And the first is that we 
we focus on a small group of patients for whom we don't think that the NOACs are a good idea. So those are patients with metal heart valves or who've got moderate to severe mitral stenosis. At the moment, those patients should be put on a vitamin K antagonist. In the case of prosthetic metal heart valves, that's because someone did a study with dabigatran and it didn't end well, and metal heart valves shouldn't go on NOACs. In the case of mitral stenosis, it's because those patients were excluded from the NOAC trials. There's not necessarily any reason to think that a NOAC wouldn't work, it's just that we haven't studied it. For all other patients, unlike in the past where we found high risk patients and treated them, the emphasis is really that you pull out the low risk patients. We do that with the use of a scoring system called the CHADS-VASC scoring system, which I haven't gone into here, but it's really available. And if your CHADS-VASC scoring system shows your risk is truly low, you shouldn't be anticoagulated, you shouldn't be given antiplatelet therapy, you shouldn't be given anything because your risk is low. For everybody else, we should be considering anticoagulation. We should use bleeding risk scores to inform us of potentially modifiable bleeding risk factors rather than using them as a barrier to anticoagulation, which has previously been how they've used, been used. And if your child's vasc is over two, you should definitely be anticoagulated. If it's over one, you should probably be anticoagulated unless there's a really good reason not to. And we should be using NOAX as a first line drug now. That's very clear and um, warfarin as an alternative if you can't. And actually uh, a week and a half ago, NICE guidance came out uh, and it's broadly speaking the same actually. The only differences, well, I mean, there are a few other differences, but there's really remarkably few, is that there's um, a goal of using Orbit AF instead of Hasfleb, which I actually think is a much better bleeding risk score and also is much better validated in this cohort. The NICE guidance also agrees that we should offer a NOAC as a first choice and just has this reminder that even if you're in the low risk treatment, make sure you come back and have a look again if the patient's age, well, the patient's age will change if they stay alive and if their comorbidities change. So just to flag the, the scores that we use, the Chads Vask, the Orbit score, um, historically, the, one of the major problems with the Hasbled is that half the things on the Hasbled are the things on the Chazvask, and that still exists to, a, to an extent in Orbit, you know, age and things like that will be a, a risk factor for both, but I think the Orbit feels like a better score in terms of what it asks you, and it certainly validates better, and it gives you a low, medium, or high risk of bleeding. Again, not a barrier to doing it, um, but a reason to think about can we fix any of those things or should we monitor more closely? So I'm a bit of a nerd. I quite like the story of warfarin. Um, this chap, Carl Link, agricultural researcher in the Midwest working for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, hence the name, who found the cows dying from a hemorrhagic disease, a compound in moldy hay. Everybody knows he went on to market rat poison and it wasn't until much later um, that there were therapeutic indications for it. And that's a bit of a PR disaster that warfarin has been struggling to get back from ever since. But the historic studies, um, with the exception of the Canadians, who must have done something a bit weird, showed that for the first time in the eight, it was the late 80s, early 90s, which I always think is surprising how recent that is that we were using. Um, we started using warfarin for stroke prevention in AF, but there was about a two thirds reduction in the risk of stroke with anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonists. So massively effective and a really fantastic treatment at its time. Another important bit of data, for, again, this comes from the warfarin era, but equally applies now. Um, and this is a slightly odd figure, but I put it in because it, I think it makes a really important message. And what it's looking at um, up the uh, y-axis is um, different age groups of patients. And those bars are looking at the net clinical benefit in those patients of anticoagulation. So it's looking at the ischemic strokes we prevent minus the bleeding brain events that might be attributable to warfarin. What we can see is that actually your net clinical benefit increases as you get older. We need to remember that because we know that older patients will bleed. And when they bleed on anticoagulation, we feel terrible about it. We feel like it's our fault. But what we have to remember is that their rate of ischemic stroke probably goes up more steeply than their rate of hemorrhagic stroke. So whilst you will never see the benefit of the stroke you do not have, and you will get bleeding complications in older people, it's a fair cop. We have to remember and believe that we are overall doing them good. 
And that comes down to physician psychology often, clinician psychology, that we would sort of rather the patient died from the disease than the treatment. And so we have to understand and believe this data. But stroke risk goes up massively in AF as you get older, and, and that's the highest risk group, and we can't avoid treating them just because we're worried about bleeding. And interestingly, NICE has also caught hold of this and the latest guidance. One of the things it's specifically put in is that we should not withhold anticoagulation just because somebody's old or because they have a lot of falls. There's a pretty good study showing that you have to fall around 290 times a year for your risk of having a brain bleeding event attributable to that to be greater than the benefit that you're getting from anticoagulation. Most people who fall over on an anticoagulant don't have an intracranial hemorrhage or a subdural. And this is from warfarin era. And by the time we go into NOACs with a much lower intracerebral bleeding event, that's even likely to be even more marked, although it hasn't been um, repeated. So, you know, why are we still talking about it? Warfarin is a brilliant treatment, reduces stroke by two thirds, reduces all cause mortality by a quarter, which really, you know, knocks everything else we do in cardiology out of the park. But as everybody here knows, it's got a narrow therapeutic window outside of which either doesn't work or you get intracranial bleeding increasing. There's a million different drug and food interactions. Uh, I got bored counting them in the BNF recently when I got to 90 and I'd only reached a B. Uh, it depends where you work in rural Ashington, where I work, drugs and alcohol are more of a problem. In some of your posher leafier parts of the South, perhaps it's the broccoli rocket and cranberry juice brigade, but either way, a million and one things will mess up your warfarin control. And it really matters. So this slide illustrates um, the risk of stroke in patients according to time and therapeutic range. I'm sure everybody on this meeting knows it, but time and therapeutic range is, is a measure really of whether how much of the time your warfarin is where it should be with a measure of time built into it so that we, uh, we don't get skewed by having three readings close together. The dotted line is if you are not anticoagulated. The blue line, black line and green line are time and therapeutic ratio over 50%. In a good warfarin clinic and in the clinical trials, you're looking at high 60s, 67, 68-ish. That's better than not being on treatment. But if your time and therapeutic range is under 50%, actually your risk of stroke is potentially higher than if you're not anticoagulated at all. And at first look, that doesn't make sense because you think, why would that be? But the thing is, if you're not in therapeutic range, you're either under anticoagulated and you get an ischemic stroke or you're over anticoagulated and you're risk of having a hemorrhagic stroke. So there is no neutral effect from being out of time in therapeutic range. Now, in the olden days, we didn't have an alternative. I'll be honest, cardiologists didn't take much interest in the warfarin clinic. They're pretty good at what they did and we left them to it. They didn't really tell us what was going on because what could we do about it anyway? But I feel now we have a moral responsibility that anyone with a time and therapeutic range that isn't good, we really need to find those patients and put them on a treatment that can get around that problem. NICE also recognizes that and, and really um, historically it's always said, you know, if you've got poor INR control, you should be um, re reviewing it. Uh, and actually later on I'll show you that NICE have been more aggressive than that and have really advocated a wholehearted switch to NOACs potentially if you're on warfarin, regardless of um, necessarily having to prove that your warfarin is bad, control is bad. So in the 50s, we first got warfarin, also known as other things uh, and other versions. And then in 2008, we got the novel anticoagulants as they were called initially, which was a bit stupid and short-sighted of us because you can't be novel forever. There's now something of a fight going on between non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants and direct oral anticoagulants. Most cardiologists go in the NOAC branch because we learn NOACs and we don't like to learn a new acronym. Uh, and a lot of the hematologists seem to be in the DOAC camp and um, ne'er the twain shall agree with each other. But there we go. That's exactly what we need, a new drug where we can't even agree what we're calling it. So these drugs have a massive amount of evidence behind them. There's a lot of naysayers out there, but these have a huge body of evidence. There were 2,900 patients in the original warfarin trials, and there's over 70,000 patients in the NOAC trials. They're not edgy, they're not crazy new untested drugs. There's hundreds of thousands of real world registry data, all of which remarkably accurately reproduces what the clinical trials showed. So I don't think there's a lot of, uh, there should be a lot of kind of fear of the unknown or new. There's four NOACs that we use for stroke prevention in AF. Um, this table keeps getting bigger and I refuse to acknowledge any new ones if any more come out because I've got no space. But um, the bigger trend is a direct thrombin inhibitor and the others are factor 10A inhibitors. 
None of them have any coagulation monitoring or food interactions. Interestingly, rivaroxaban needs to be taken with a big, big meal. It and initially, I'm slightly embarrassed about how I found out about this, and I find that most people actually don't know about this, even if you do a lot of work in the area. But my mother-in-law takes rivaroxaban, and she was wittering on about it, and I was a bit dismissive. I thought it was one of those indigestion things that nobody cares about. But I looked it up, and it affects the bioavailability by, by a massive, massive amount if you don't take it with food. I don't think most patients know that. It's not a little Nana's breakfast of a piece of toast. It needs to be taken with a significant calorie meal. I suspect people in the clinical trials did do that, but people in the real world don't do that. And certainly that concerns me that we're not using rivaroxaban in the correct way when we use it widely. And it puts me off using it along with other reasons I'll come on to. They're all renal excreted to a greater or lesser extent, which is really important to remember down the line. The bigger trend in rivaroxaban had some slight uh, increase in dyspepsia compared to warfarin, the others did not. By and large, both warfarin and the NOACs are pretty well tolerated actually, in terms of kind of the random side effects that people seem to get. The bigotran and apixaban are twice daily, rivaroxaban and edoxaban are once daily. All the drugs have a similar half-life. The decision regarding dosing is a strategic decision taken on by the manufacturers at the time they did their kind of launch and clinical trials. All of the drugs have dose modifications based on a combination of creatinine clearance. And in the case of apixaban and adoxaban also includes weight, age, creatinine and interacting medications. It's tempting maybe to say, oh, well, the ones with the simpler dosing regimes, it's easier to remember. <clears throat> and indeed it is. But when I show you some of the outcome data, hopefully we'll see that actually the uh, ones that have a more refined dosing schedule where you tailor the dose of the drug to the patient a bit more, are the ones that have the better um, efficacy safety balance outcomes, which perhaps isn't a surprise since all patients are not the same size. So this slide just summarizes, um, because I always, it was certainly in the early days, had to keep looking it up, uh, how we modify um, the doses of NOAX. So dabigatran, you can use it down to a creatinine clearance of 30 and then all bets are off. The others you can use down to 15. Adoxaban and rivaroxaban, you reduce at 50. Apixaban, you don't have to reduce till 30, but it has this dose reduction if you're um, skinny or old or got a crack and over 133. And this slide is just a reminder really about the, the perils of inappropriate dosing. It's incredibly common. Um, I did an audit locally and you know, over and under dosing is, is incredibly common, even when you've got pharmacists checking everything in, in an inpatient setting. But this database um, identified groups of individuals who should have been on a reduced dose who weren't, and a large group of people who didn't have an indication for a reduced dose, but it was reduced. We know anecdotally that a lot of people will go, well, they're a bit old and a bit crumbly and a bit this, and they will reduce the dose thinking they're doing the patient a favor. And what we can see on, on, on the, this slide, specifically with the underdose group, where it's, I think, the most important, that with a Pixaban, if people are reducing the dose when they shouldn't be, you effectively give them a similar amount of harm in terms of bleeding, but it is much less effective at stroke prevention. So we shouldn't assume that reducing the dose inappropriately will actually be a good thing for the patient. You risk giving them all of the harm and none of the benefit, and we should follow what the studies did, and we shouldn't go freestyle because we think we know best. This is just a summary. Obviously, they're not head-to-head -head trials. All these studies were independently done against warfarin, but it's all we have to look at these drugs and try and sort of tease out who might be right for which one. The top panel is looking at prevent stroke and systemic embolus prevention. And we can see that dabigatran in the bit bigger dose and apixaban, which is Aristotle, um, showed that they were better than warfarin at preventing stroke and systemic embolus. And in a non-inferiority trial, which is what they're all designed to be, that's pretty impressive. The others were non-inferior. And again, apixaban and adoxaban were, uh, had reduced major bleeding compared to warfarin. The other two were non-inferior. If we were to show intracranial hemorrhage, it would show that actually all of the NOACs have a significantly reduced rate of intracranial hemorrhage compared to warfarin. And that's how they drive much of the benefit, including much of the benefit in stroke prevention, is not that they are better at preventing ischemic strokes, it's that you don't get the bleeding strokes that were attributable to warfarin. <clears throat> 
Pixaban's also got some quite nice data where they took about five and a half thousand people who couldn't or wouldn't take warfarin and randomized them to aspirin or a Pixaban. And in the top panel, we can see the risk of stroke and systemic embolism. And so a Pixaban is much better at preventing a stroke than aspirin. And we can see that a Pixaban and aspirin have similar rates of major bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage. This shouldn't be a surprise to us because actually there's data from the warfarin era that shows pretty much the same thing. But as clinicians, we seem to refuse to accept that aspirin and anticoagulation are not so different in their risk profile. I don't know whether anticoagulation isn't as dangerous as we think it is, or aspirin isn't as safe as we think it is, but this data is, is reproduced with warfarin and with apixaban and shows that um, if you've got a patient who you're happy to be on aspirin, you should probably be happy with them being on apixaban. So there's lots of pros and cons. I always get asked which no action I use, how do I know which one to use? Um, this is my opinion. It's not necessarily right or wrong. The recent NICE guidance initially came out with some guidance about which no act to use based on efficacy, safety and cost. And when it went into consultation, it got so slammed and became so controversial that they've ended up coming out with a, oh, patient choice, see what you think, use, do whatever you want, which is fine. But if a group of experts can't decide, it's a bit harsh to say it's down to the patients. Um, but dibigitran for me has a small niche and I use it for people who have had an ischemic stroke, particularly on treatment. That's because at its big dose, it's the only one that's shown to be more effective than warfarin for specific group of ischemic strokes only. Whether it really makes any difference for that patient, but it makes us all feel better. If you've had a stroke on a treatment, you're probably going to want to change something. The 110 dose does have less major bleeding than warfarin if bleeding risk is your concern, although I would suggest that a Pixaban probably does that better. It's the least liver excreted all of, them, of all of them if your liver's a problem. It was the first to get a reversal agent. Um, pragmatically, we haven't really found we've needed to use the reversal agents very much because the drugs wear off pretty quickly and you are never over anticoagulated, unlike with warfarin. It has got higher GI side effects compared to warfarin. It's the most susceptible to renal impairment and you have to stock it with a creatinine clearance of 30. You can't go in a dessert box or crush it and it's a big old horse tablet compared to the others, which are nice little tablets. It's twice daily and I kind of have come full circle on this. I initially thought a once daily must be better because for compliance reasons, people are more likely to take it. However, there are, as I said, they've got the same half-lives, these drugs. So if you take it once daily, you have bigger peaks and bigger troughs, which, under, which may be part of the reason we see um, some of the things I'll come on to. Similarly, if you miss one dose of a once daily drug, you have a very long period unprotected with anticoagulation. If you miss one dose of a twice daily drug, you have a shorter period of being unprotected. So there are some patients for whom twice daily is a disaster, of course, but where possible, I think I've come around to the idea of twice daily probably being a good, or at least not a bad option. Rivaroxaban is once daily if you're after that kind of thing, but really it's only non-inferior to warfarin for stroke and bleeds. There's an increased risk of GI bleeds compared to warfarin, which I think relates to the peaks and troughs you see with a once daily medication. And you have to take it with this big meal, which I really don't believe anyone does. And Pixaban has the best data probably. Um, it's got, uh, it sort of bests warfarin for everything really, um, bleeding, stroke, mortality. Um, so that's good. It's got this nice data comparing with aspirin, which the others didn't have, albeit it's probably the same. Um, it's got good data in real impairment. And actually the nice CKD guidance specifically says we should use a Pixaban in people with CKD as opposed to anything else, which obviously does not concord with the cardiology guidance in the usual way. Um, and it's twice daily, which, you know, we've, we've touched upon. Adoxaban for me falls somewhere between a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban. It's once daily, and if I need a once daily drug, it's the one that I use. It's got similar efficacy, but it does have reduced major bleeding, and they've managed to slice out a cardiovascular mortality benefit. There's a bit of data looking at people who've got very good kidneys, saying it may not work as well, which kind of makes sense. But I strongly suspect that's something of a class effect for all of them if we were to look at it. Most people with really, really good kidneys probably don't have AF. And there's an, again, increase in GI bleeds compared to warfarin, I think, relating to the once dailiness. So that's a stroke prevention of AF. Does COVID change anything? Um, does COVID increase the risk of AF? Does AF increase the risk of COVID? Does AF increase the risk of you dying from COVID? Does COVID increase the risk from your AF? All interesting questions. 
Um, are you more likely to get AF if you've got COVID? Yeah, probably, but so do pretty much every other critical illness that makes your lungs go bad and puts you on critical care. Does AF increase the risk of you getting COVID in the first place? Probably not. Does AF increase the risk of you dying from COVID is a bit more interesting. There's nothing definitive, but it's tricky because AF associates with all the comorbidities that we know do. It associates with hypertension, obesity, diabetes, heart failure, structural heart disease, all of which are bad news. And AF was present in about 22% of the Italian COVID deaths in the first wave. So it certainly features. And I think it is an important point about COVID increasing the risk from AF. Now, nobody's really got any hard data from this, but we know in other areas, and I'm sure you'll have talks on this today, that um, COVID is very procoagulant, it makes you sticky, and it's highly likely that therefore you do carry a, a significant risk of thrombosis from your AF. Sometimes when people are sick in hospital, we end up saying, oh, we won't start their anticoagulation for the AF because they've only just gone into it or they might come out of it or it's all just because of the COVID or they're too sick. And this is a reminder really that if they go into AF with COVID, we should be pretty aggressive about anticoagulating them for the AF. Does COVID change anything in terms of um, anticoagulant choice and switching? Well, early on in COVID, actually NHS England sent out this remit saying effectively, we're probably not gonna be able to cope with warfarin services. We're not sure it's a good idea to bring old people up to hospital for it, which I agree with. Um, actually, let's just switch them all to NOACs. Now, it, this happened in a patchy way, I think, because everyone was so busy keeping their head above water that maybe primary care didn't really have the time or the head space to do this proactively. So some places did and some didn't, but actually to an extent, it's been superseded now anyway, because the latest NICE guidance says that when we next routinely review our warfarin patients, we should be discussing the option of switching. Yes, we take into account time and therapeutic range, but pretty much everyone, it's reasonable to offer a switch, which I think is a fair call. Certainly if I was taking warfarin, I think I would want to switch even if my warfarin was well controlled. In terms of switching, I mean, the SPCs have fairly detailed guidance about how to do it, but a pragmatic approach, which I've tended to take, is to say, um, stop your warfarin, after two or three days, get yourself an INR. If your INR is kind of heading towards subtherapeutic, sub -therapeutic, just start the NOAC. If it's not quite there yet, leave it a bit longer and check it again. Or if you really don't wanna bring the patient up, just leave it a bit longer and start the NOAC. You know it'll come down eventually. It's not necessarily the perfect way of doing it, but trying to get people off warfarin to have regular blood checks and then bringing them in for daily blood checks somehow seems a bit counterintuitive. In the time I've got, I'm just going to do a, a Thomas Whistle Stop tour just through some of the um, interesting, challenging patient groups that I get asked about all the time whenever I talk about this kind of thing. So I'm kind of trying to preempt it. Uh, so obesity, myocardial infarction, stents, pattern of AF and cancer. So obesity is unfortunately incredibly common in patients with AF. I would go so far to say as obesity causes AF. Um, and we know that BMI can affect pharmacokinetics. The official line is really, in my opinion, overly cautious, saying you have to be cautious with no X if your BMI is over 40 or your weight is greater than 120 kilograms. There's relatively limited data um, in the high BMI groups, but the people who did have a BMI over 40 in the Aristotle and Engage, which are the Apixaban and Dodoxaban studies, um, did perfectly well with the NOAC. And there's lots of smaller studies uh, that, that support this. So most uh, cardiologists and most hematologists, when you talk to them, pretty happy up to a BMI of about 50, certainly up to a weight of about 140, although I'd be interested to hear from your, your um, audience, many of whom I suspect are more hematology based on, on where they stand with that. But there's not a lot of enthusiasm for level monitoring, certainly uh, in, the, in our local and regional cardiology, um, hematologists. Another challenging area is what to do with patients who have had uh, acute coronary syndromes or stents who've got atrial fibrillation and need anticoagulation. So this has changed and it continues to change all the time. This is the latest from, again, a couple of weeks ago, latest ESC um, summary of this. And I think there's a couple of important things to say, which is um, stent thrombosis is a really bad thing, but it probably isn't as common as we think it is. And if it is going to happen, it happens early. Double and triple therapy with antiplatelets and anticoagulants is a massive increased risk of bleeding, is a really bad thing in terms of risk. And somewhere along the line, we need to reach a compromise. 
over the years, we have realized we do not have to be as aggressive as we have historically been, but it changes all the time. And as and I would strongly suggest that any guidance, particularly if you work in primary care, your cardiologist should tell you what to do for the first year. And if they haven't told you, you should ask them. And if things change, you should ask them. It's not fair to expect primary care to make a decision about this kind of thing because it's too complicated and we must take responsibility for, for informing people. And effectively what we're saying is that usually you can get away with a week of triple therapy. If you're doing triple therapy, we should be using a NOAC. The NOAC data is much better than the warfarin data. Um, and there's data for all NOACs actually, although apixaban has the most comprehensive clinical trial. We should be using aspirin and clopidogrel rather than any of the other antiplatelet agents, which are more potent and therefore probably not a good idea usually. And if we do use the other agents, we shouldn't do it for long. Uh, if you're having elective PCI, you can probably be then be on dual therapy for six months and then you take a NOAC thereafter. If you've had an acute coronary syndrome, you should probably be on dual therapy for up to a year. And then after that, you can go on a NOAC on its own. So effectively a year after a heart attack, a year after stents, um, then anticoagulation alone is sufficient. And in that first year, effectively, we need to tell you what to do. There are things that will make us more intensive, which is cardiac stent related stuff and how messy it looked and how many stents and all the rest of it. And there are things that will make us a bit more concerned about bleeding risk, which will make us less aggressive in terms of antiplatelet therapy and NOAC combinations. These patients need to be kept an eye on because they do bleed. The other thing is about AF pattern and stroke risk. I often get asked, well, what if it's just one episode or what if they only have short episodes? Do I have to anticoagulate them? But the early clinical trials of Firm and Race looked at the different strategies of rate and rhythm control, i.e. leave you an AF or try and get you out of it. And those studies had similar stroke risk, which is interesting. Intuitively, you think if you're not an AF, your risk should be lower, but it probably doesn't work like that. Stroke risk probably does relate to AF duration and frequency a bit, but there are two important things there. One, there, nobody knows exactly where the bottom limit is and nobody knows at what point it's safe not to anticoagulate. We know that the AF burden reported by patients is really unreliable. Human beings are a very poor witness to their AF. You have patients who say, I've had no AF doctor at all since I last saw you, but when they have a pacemaker or a loop recorder, which means we can see what's happening, they are usually completely wrong. They could have been having hours and hours of it. They just didn't know. It might have been overnight. They didn't feel it. So you mustn't believe the patient who says they've had no AF or they only last an hour because they could be wrong. And even five or six minutes of atrial fibrillation will increase your risk of having a stroke. And again, we know that from patients who've got devices implanted. And plenty of strokes happen in sinus rhythm. Somebody did a trial starting and stopping anticoagulation called IMPACT. Um, according to what the loop recorder said, I am I an AF or not, start and stop, start and stop. And they had a much higher stroke risk. So it is not as simple as you only need to be on your anticoagulation when you're in AF. So to cut a long story short, you treat paroxysmal exactly the same as persistent. And as far as I'm concerned, if you've had a single episode of AF, you've got paroxysmal AF and you're guilty till proven innocent. Rarely, I will prove someone innocent. For example, after cardiothoracic surgery with no other specific risk factors or a young fit person who's had severe sepsis or something. So rarely we will, but usually if your COPD exacerbation has brought on an episode of AF, it will happen again. Um, and therefore you must assume they've got AF. Cancer uh, was an exclusion for all of the AF NOAC trials. Uh, most people probably know more about VT, well, everybody on this call probably knows more about VTE than I do, but um, uh, the VTE data suggests that um, NOACs maybe have higher bleeding but do seem to work. Um, and in AF there were patients in the apixaban um, and adoxaban arms, and actually there's meta-analysis as well, which shows that previous or developing cancer during the study, it wasn't really a problem. They had similar benefits and they didn't particularly have worrying bleeding risks. So most of us are comfortable using NOAX for atrial fibrillation in cancer, but we do need to be aware of some of the drug interactions, specifically the chemotherapy that those patients may be undergoing, which can be a bit of a nuisance. 
so my final slide timing wise i'm nearly there I've been a bit long um anticoagulation in af is hugely effective at preventing stroke which no you use warfarin all of that's the icing on the cake um but it's important to do something that's the most important thing and really no should be first line for most people now COVID doesn't change things very much, actually, but the main challenge is going to be that we have to diagnose atrial fibrillation in the first place. And as cardiologists and primary care physicians, we're going to have to really up our game to try and make sure that we don't miss those patients. Thank you. I'm sorry if I've run into question time. Apologies. No, no, that's lovely. Thank you very, very much for that. Very informative. Abdel Hamad. Hamdi Ramadan has got a question here for you. Can we give a Pixaban five milligrams once a day in dialysis patients to improve compliance? So officially, I can't tell you the answer to that um, because there's a clinical trial ongoing at the moment looking at dialysis and end-stage renal patients. So the first thing to say, almost certainly, I think we're, from the signals from those trials that we're going to get to a point where there probably isn't a lower limit on dosing of the NOAX according to renal failure. But at the minute, there isn't really any evidence in that dialysis population about what the right thing to do is. And those people typically should be in clinical trials. Thank so you. you could try it, but I couldn't. I couldn't tell you it was safe. But then warfarin's rubbish in that group as well. So it's a little bit kind of do what you fancy until the trial publishes. I think. There aren't any questions currently waiting, unless anybody is in the middle of typing. Um, doesn't look like there's any more. No, so we'll leave it there, Dr. Thomas. Thank you so very, very much Pleasure. for your time um, and for a very, very informative um, presentation. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference.